president of the APOA, Jamal Ashraf, for all his assistance with uh, making sure that it works so uh, well. We have the pleasure this evening and this morning and this afternoon of uh, enjoying a series of talks from uh, world-renowned experts, good friends from across the Asia-Pacific region and also South America. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Ismail Hadisobroto de Longo, who is the uh, chair of AO Trauma Indonesia and the professor at the Department of Orthopedics and the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Indonesia, Sipto Mangal Kusumo Hospital. I'd also like to uh, introduce and welcome Vincenzo Giordano, who is a uh, key trauma specialist in AO Trauma, who's been the previous uh, chair of the LAT group, is the re current research officer of AO LAT, and is a member of the AO Trauma Global Research Commission. I'd like to also welcome Peter Giannoudis, who's currently caught up, unfortunately, as a trauma surgeon in managing one of the traumas at his hospital. He's the professor of trauma and orthopedics at the uh, University of Leeds, is the editor and chief of injury, is the research officer of the AO UK, and uh, he is a member of the AO Trauma uh, Global Research Commission. I'd like to also welcome John Mukupadaya, who's the chairman and consultant orthopedic surgeon in uh, Patna at Bihar in India and previous chair of orthopedics research and education foundation in India and is on numerous editorial boards. Welcome, John. And also my good friend, Apipop Kritsani Philbun, who uh, is the chief of uh, the trauma unit is the assistant professor of orthopedics at the Prince of Songla University, and, and he really is a uh, very welcome member of many regional and international conferences that the AO holds. And I'd also like to introduce and welcome our uh, moderators today. There's Sui Yensi Limbong, who is an orthopedic and trauma surgeon at the Ushman Hospital at Medan, Indonesia, and she's currently doing a fellowship in hip, hip and knee surgery. Um, welcome. And Nagashri Vasudeva, who's a junior orthopedic consultant in Ganga at the Ganga Hospital in Kombador in India. And she's currently doing her fellowship in trauma care at Ganga. So welcome all. Please feel free to send in your questions, which will be moderated for us to answer either online at the end of each section and at the end of the webinar um, with uh, many of the faculty participating. So now I'd like to hand over to Sue Yensi to start proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Marinis, for your great introduction. We will have a very interesting webinar, which is the distal femoral fracture. It can be challenging and complex and can be tricky for the orthopedic surgeon. And for our first uh, speaker, Professor Ismail Hadi Subrato Di Logo, he will enlighten us with the topic isolated comminuted medial or lateral condyle fracture. Please, Professor, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Suyansi. So I would like to share my screen. Have you uh, view my PowerPoint, right? Yep, it's all good, Ismail. Yes. Thank you. Good evening to the distinguished audience of the webinar. During this session, we will discuss community medial or lateral condylar in distal femoral fractures. As we know, the AOOTA divided the distal femoral fracture into three types, namely type A, B, and C. So for the Type A, as to articular, we do definitive treatment with a single unilateral distal femoral locking plates. And for the C2 and C3, we use uh, double platings. And how about the unicondylar femoral condyle fractures? Although unicondylar fractures are rare, is it, it has a lot of associated injury that are tendon rupture, medial avulsion or stida fractures, community fractures usually, and open fractures uh, associated with tibia plateau fractures and knee dislocation with the 
multiple ligament injury. Let's take a look at this male, 65 years old, that came with the left knee pain and swelling and no neurovascular deficit. He was temporarily stabilized using long leg slap. Any idea of the diagnosis? On this kind of case, do you think we need to perform CT scan? For diagnosis, the fractures, ambulatory status, and persistent knee arthritis is very important. During physical exam, it is important to note if there is a discrepancy in pulse. However, it is important to note that the presence of the distal pulse does not exclude vascular injury. On radiological examination, aside from the standard X-ray, CT scan is recommended to be conducted as 55% uh, of the fractures are formed intraarticular involvement. As we can see from this CT scan, patient has uh, isolated medial condyle femoral fractures with the intraarticular involvement. What do you think? Uh, what for the definitive fixation? Screw only, plate and screw, or combination of them. In general, if the fracture pattern is simple, we can use a leg screw. And while for the commutative fractures, we have to use screw with the buttress plate. A patient went for surgery with the anterolateral approach for the definitive treatment using two cancellous cannulated screw and one full threaded cancellous compression screw with the buttress plate. Here, the post-operative radiology compression. On, on uh, post-operative, we can see the patient in day one and uh, is full leg bearing, and then on the full leg bearing, on achieved at the 12 feet. Here, the one year's functional follow-up. At the year's follow-up, patient have a full ring of motion, could sit, uh, could sit cross legs, squat, and walk painlessly. And regular examination, so union of the fracture side. Another case, this male, 40 years old. Uh, in this case, we can see the patient have the open fracture dislocation of the right distal femoral fractures. Femur with the patellar tender ruptures and uh, multi-ligament knee injury. First thing to do, in this case, we, we do the debridement and then expose the fracture side. And we, we have to do the leg screw fixation because interarticular and then uh, supplement it with a K-wire insertion, transfixing. And then we do the patellar tendon uh, repairs using Craco suture techniques and then follow with the LCL repair. And uh, we the next step is we do the tension and band wirings and coring to the proximal tibia or tuberculosis tibia. And finally, we apply external fixation. This the here the post-operative comparison. Uh, external fixation is not indicated for the definitive treatment, especially display displays intraarticular fractures. And of course, uh, external fixation. Especially, uh, the indication are for temporary fixation or for the definitive treatment for stable and displaced fractures as long as the epiphysis has first stabilized. It disadvantages are difficult to control alignment, poor stability, and increased stiffness. Here, the post-operative removal external vision after one month and then uh, follow up at uh, five months. Another case, this uh, also a uh, male, also young adult, 24 years. This also a um, motor vehicle accident, uh, struck by truck. We can see the patient is open fractures. Open consists of the open of the lateral condyle, of fractures, with the open left tibia plateau fractures and proximal tibia. And also the patient has experienced drop left foot, but the interesting in this case, we the we do the debridements, the debridement, and then rep, uh, tendon rupture repairs, and then external fixation. The interesting case is 
the communication, the lateral condyle, not only communication, but also there is some loss. So how about now the homework, our homework now, what do you think is suitable for the definitive treatment in this patient? How do you do the choosing of the definitive treatment in HOFA lateral femoral condyle uh, with associated with the loss? Uh, this study by the GCP at all from in from injury, coronal fractures of the lateral femoral condyle, yeah, type three HOFA with the missing lateral condyle, like like uh, dissimilar with with uh, one of the our case. We can note there is a huge amount of uh, lateral femoral condyle loss in the in this patient. The author uh, using lateral femoral condyle reconstruction with a massive osteochondral allograft and fixed with a two 4.0 connected screw and 3.0 connected Herbert compression screw. This is the at two years follow up. We can see there is a good functional outcome and MRI, so good bone osteointegration of the allograft. The same, the same thing like uh, our uh, with our case, but the our case is the neglected, neglected malunion floating knee with the knee disluxation. We can see there is a fusion on the medial uh, condyle fractures, fusion with the articular cartilage of the tibia plateau. So in this case, we also using technique uh, using femoral head allograft to reconstruct the missing of the uh, <coughs> medial condyle. This another case, this geriatric, geriatric case, 78 years old, with the, in this case, with the medial, fem, medial femoral condyle, non-union, and the authors uh, performing the retrograde intramedullar nailing with the bone grafting. Why they choose the intramedullary nail over the plate and screw? Uh, because in this case, intramedullary nailing was chosen uh, with, with the secure fixation of the medial condyle provided by pairs of the condyle screw and nuts, which are implant as stories designed for use in the osteoporotic bone. Intramedullary nailing achieved the angular and rotational stability and improved stability through the bone grafting at the defect site. And plate and screw was considered excluded because the standard anatomical locking plate for the distal femur are for the lateral condyle. The plate were, that were designed for the medial application are in the contact of the distal femoral osteotomy fixation and not for the fracture fixation. And this, the another case, also the geriatric, uh, older, two years, 80 years old woman. In this medial osteoporotic medial femoral condyle fractures, alternatively, the author proposed the using LCP proximal TBL plate 4.5 that applied upside down and like screw fixation using two connoted cancel screw. Uh, Kodama used leg screw fixation and plating with the proximal tibia plating for the same side as a buttress plate to counteract the vertical sharing forces. In also geriatric, but in this case, the interesting case is the there is CT scan reveal communication extending to the intercondylar region. Uh, in, this, in this case, the author performing primary total knee arthroplasty with the allograft reconstruction of the medial condyle and MCL reconstruction. Extensive combination, osteochondral damage, and poor bone quality are the factors that weigh against rigid internal physician. Associated comorbidity and pre existing arthritis favor arthroplasty as the to attain early full weight bearing ambulation. Uh, this is the, uh, our case that uh, undisplaced in, in uh, young adult, but undisplaced uh, medial condyle fractures. So this in the stable and non-displaced fracture, non-articular fracture is one of the indication we 
we can do the conservative treatment such as long leg spin, knee bracing, and long leg cast and skin or skeletal traction. With the treatment cochlear cast application, at the six month follow up, patient can do squatting, slow run, jumping, and perform uh, solat praying uh, at ahiyat position that's very important for Muslim country to do the squatting and also the at ahiyat praying position. But for the displaced medial condylar fractures, medial femoral condylar fractures, and we do the conservative treatment like this case, uh, create a result in uh, some ferrous malunion of fractures. But interestingly, the patient still can have attain, I mean, achieve some functional uh, squatting and uh, praying position, at a yet praying position. Thank you, Mrs. Unicondylar femoral fractures has a bimodal distribution mechanism injury, high energy injury for the young, and low energy in the elderly. Previous ambulatory condition is very important to make decision, and CT scan, is the gold standard in the distal femoral fracture diagnosis as uh, 55% demonstrate intraarticular involvement and high risk of the misdiagnosis. In medial condyle fractures, cancel select screw provide sufficient fixation to provide early ring of motion, but in cases of the com commutative or osteoporotic bone, a combination with the buttress plate may be necessary. External physician is not indicated for the definitive treatment, especially for the displaced intraarticular fracture, but can be recommended for a junction if the if the patient has the like open fractures, floating knee, and also with the uh, as the temporary physician. No available plate that fit for the femoral medial condyle fixation. Alternatively. We could, we could use LCP proximal tibial plate 4.5 applied upside down. And retrograde IM kneeling are indicated in the extra-articular unicondylar femoral fractures. In intra-articular fractures, additional screw physician is indicated. And total knee arthroplasty is indicated in extensive communication, osteochondral damage, poor bone quality, and pre-existing arthritis joint to attain early embolization. Conservative treatment still has role in cases of the stable, non-displaced, non-articular fractures, and non ambulatory patient, and multiple comorbidity. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Professor Ismail, for your clear explanation. So we have some question in the box. Uh, for the first question from uh, Dr. Jamal, uh, so this isolated fracture always be buttressed with a plate. If you don't buttress it with plate, uh, just with the screw, uh, um, did you delay the mobilization? That's for the first question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shensi. Yes, of course, as mentioned earlier in my previous uh, slide, uh, the, the leg screw is usually for the, uh, with the pattern of fractures is the uh, simple, simple. But if you have the pattern of fractures is communication or a patient with a poor bone stock with the osteoporotic bone, so we should use the uh, buttress plate combining screw and uh, buttress plate. Why? Uh, because uh, according to the study, that uh, the the buttress plate is uh, to try to counteract to neutralize the uh, vertical sharing force. So that's why uh, we have to uh, supplement it with a, a buttress plate yeah, uh, in combination of uh, less screw. Thank you, Prof. So, uh, when you when for the simple simple condyle fracture, you use screw. Uh, do you delay the mobilization compared if you put buttress plate? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, the the, the no mobilization is uh, early mobilization, but of course, with the uh, if uh, the patient, especially in the uh, communication, poor bone stock, uh, we have to uh, we should we should delay the the. Wake bearing, but mobilization 
we have to directly to mobilize because the that's the one of the goal of the uh, articular fem uh, articular fracture physician is uh, the first goal is uh, is not only uh, joint congruity but also uh, early mobilization Thank you, Prof. For the next question, uh, as you mentioned, we can manage the missing condylar fragment with allograph. How if we don't have the allograph uh, for that case? And then, yes, uh, what for the, you mean the allograph for the yes femoral health allograph? Uh, we can see that uh, there is uh, if there is loss yeah. or in the osteoporotics. And also with the uh, bone loss, uh, we have to use the uh, using allograft to uh, to reconstruct. And there is a there is a, we have to divide it in the young adult or in the elderly. Like in the elderly, like in in uh, in the young adult, that I have also not only the authors uh, one of the in, in in the injury publication, and uh, also in series of uh, my case. Uh, if there is loss, some loss, so there is no stock, but the patient still young, so it is. Uh, is it very uh, pity? Yeah, if if you if we do the arthroplasty, we have to reconstruct as much as possible to uh, have the joint congruity. So that's why we can uh, reconstruct uh, uh, the 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 loss with, with the, uh, using femoral head allograft because. Allograph, there is also a uh, part of the cartilage uh, surface, right? And and also we have to uh, reconstruct also the ligament, yeah? the ligament, collateral ligament, MCL or LCL. MCL in this case mostly is medial condyle. And for the for the elderly, that much communication, not only using extended time uh, arthroplasty, but in the there is some loss at that time. We have to combine it with uh, with the also allograft to uh, this look like of the you know uh, uh, APC yeah, uh, composite graph that combine it with the processes. Thank you, Prof. I think we still have time for the last question. Uh, if we treat the the fracture, I mean, it's like the non-displaced fracture conservatively, as we know, intraarticular, we need the stable fixation, we need anatomical reduction for early mobilization. If you do the conservative treatment, there's a chance to to cause a stiffness. How do you deal with the stiffness in conservative treatment? Yeah, we can uh, we can uh, do the early mobilization after after three or four weeks because uh, uh, I believe the cancellous bone is uh, the is uh, the healing is very fast, so you can gain uh, clinical yeah some callus yeah, some soft callus in the three or four weeks. So after one month, you can do the uh, changing with also the changing of the your cast you can do the mobilization but if if there is some of the cases that uh, have a difficulty uh, a difficulty if, if uh, neglect yeah, for some month for the for the rehab if uh, in some cases we can also do arthrolysis using scope yeah, to do arthrolysis to help uh, release the addition but uh, most of the cases with uh, if you uh, the patient regularly uh, do the follow ups so uh, after one month changing uh, your your casting or you can you can uh, change it with a brace with a knee brace that we can uh, easily uh, set up the ring of motion adjust the ring of motion in the knee region so the patient will have to know that. Yeah. So, uh, Ismail, just can I just ask a question, Swensi? Yes. Yes. Okay. So these are intraarticular fractures, and uh, don't you think there's a problem with delayed union and non-union with these fractures? Because if you don't fix them early and get them mobilized early, apart from stiffness, there's also the risk of delayed unions and non-unions. <laughs> Yeah, yes. most, mostly if uh, uh, displaced, yeah, 
displaced. Yeah. Yeah, for the displaced, and uh, we we not only dealing with the stiffness, but most important thing the the non-union, yeah, with the non-union, yeah. and also, uh, but yeah. uh, but in uh, mostly, uh, but it's very rare, but uh, usually, especially in the uh, poor bone stock, yeah, poor bone stock uh, quality of bone, and but for in the young patient, uh, rarely, yeah, rarely. I I found the uh, non-union mostly is uh, malunion for the displaced. Okay. okay, thank you, Prof. This is a very interesting discussion, but we're running out of time, so we will move to to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I will hand over to Dr. Nagasri for the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Sunji. So moving on to the second talk of today, without further delay. We have Professor Vincenzo Giardano, who is going to talk to us about commutated distal femur fractures. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Nagashri. Thank you, my friend Marinis and Jamal, for the invitation. This is the second time I'm invited for the Asia Pacific uh, Trauma Society meeting, and it's an honor. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, Marinis asked me to talk about the difficult situations on comminuted distal femur fractures. And I have 14 minutes to talk about this, this challenging situation, so let's move on. This is my disclosure. So we all know that distal femur fractures account for up to 30% of all femur fractures. And when we talk about the high energy C2 and C3 fracture patterns, the management is challenging. And moreover, when we have trochlear comminution, and this is the most challenging situation in distal femur fractures, there is a scarce literature regarding this uh, specific type of fracture. So in the next 14 minutes, uh, we're going to pass through three topics. First, the idea is to recognize that this, the comminuted distal femur fracture related problems, and we have to, to learn a little bit, and we have to understand these problems in order to treat this, these injuries adequately. The second step is to remember the operative strategies for metaphysical comminution, I mean the C2 fracture pattern. And finally, we're going to discuss the operative principles, the steps for the articular comminution. Uh, specifically, we're going to concern, we're going to uh, discuss the C3 fracture pattern with trochlear involvement. So the first thing that we have to, know, to learn uh, regarding this of femur fractures is to recognize the fracture-related problems. And in my opinion, we have three problems. The first is the metaphysical combination. And this is one of the most important aspects nowadays when we manage this of femur fractures. We have to understand if we have or if we don't have the integrity of the medial wall the medial metaphyseal wall. We know that the morphology of the distal femur is such as a teacup. So we have a uh, uh, Meyer frusk. So we have a large metaphysis, and then we have a very narrow diaphysis. So when we have a medial wall failure, as represented in this, uh, on the right side of this, the, 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 the slide, and we use a lateral implant, we don't have any, any load sharing in the medial wall. So all, all the load passes through the implant. So the implant suffers a load bearing and this overload can lead to an implant failure and bone healing disturbances. And, and there is a very, a uh, new article from Michael Gardner published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma showing that despite of the lateral plate that we use, and they use three different lateral plates, locket plates, they found uh, up to 14% of non-unions and up to 9% of mechanical failure of the implant because of the uh, absence of medial wall contact in the metaphyseal zone. So what we have to do is try to augment our lateral fixation to have a load sharing construction. So what we have to do is to add a second implant 
And when I talk about implant, it's not only metal. We can use, for example, and you can see in the most left uh, X-ray, we can use, for example, a structural graft, such as the, the fibula, for example. And the, the principle is to have a lateral implant and a medial implant, so we can have a very good construction in a load sharing, uh, a load sharing construction. So let's see this case. This is a six year old lady. She suffered a ladder fall, no comorbidities, an open fracture. You can see a very large metaphysical comminution and a small comminution of the articulate surface. And we decided to use a locket plate with some leg screws to hold and to put some interfragmentary compression on the articular side, but we add some cortical cancellous autogenous bone graft on the medial side to have a load sharing construction. And this is the x-ray after five years with a nice bone healing and no medial subsidence. The second problem that we have to know is, is uh, concerns the existence of previous implants. Moreover, when we have a very obese patient, and this is a very interesting case. A lady, she had, she's 80 years old. She had a total knee replacement eight years before in the US. She was visiting her daughter in Brazil and she suffered a fall to the ground. She has less than two comorbidities and this is the fracture pattern. A stable implant, a Horaback type B, type two. And we made a CT scan to understand if the the, 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 the femoral component of the TKR had a, a cage or not, had an open passage for a nail, and we decided to do a nail plate combination. And this is the lady after two months. We can see a very nice healing, but the fracture was not united. After three months, she was walking adequately and she had to come back to the States, but she sent me some pictures of the x-rays after six months and the fracture is healed with no medial subsidence in this uh, very strong construction, the nail plate combination. And this is another, another lady, uh, a periprosthetic uh, distal femur fracture, and you can see a very huge defect in the anterior, anterior medial wall of the distal femur and this lady had two previous surgeries for hip fixations so we decided to do an open reduction and this is the intraoperative images and you can see on the most right image you can see the very huge defect of the interior wall so we decided to to replace the bone of the anterior wall with an anterior plate a horizontal plate a one foot tubular plate as the bone, because we don't have bone bank, and we put a nail, a retrograde nail. This is the lady after one year post-op with a very nice healing, and this is after two years post-op, and you can see a very nice construction and an overlap, uh, an overlap of the retrograde nail with the, the sliding hip implant that she had previously. And the third problem is the articular comminution. So we had two different types of problems when we concern articular comminution. One is the trochlear involvement, you can see on the left side, and the other one is the half injuries with some central impaction, and Peter Janodis will talk about that, so we're not going to talk about half fractures, just the trochlear comminution. And we have to know the operative principles for the c tripe fractures with trochlear involvement. And the first one is to reconstruct, if possible, of course, nicely and adequately and anatomically at the articular surface. And you can see this, uh, this intraoperative images. You go step by step. And the first step is to reconstruct the condyles. So if we have some half a fracture, you have to solidarize the, the anterior component with the posterior component of one unicondylar unit. And then you put everything together. And the other thing is to avoid interfragmentary compression. You can see by this drawing, when you apply some interfragmentary compression and you have a central, a central comminution, a trochlear involvement, what happens is that you have a narrow condylar area and this generates an incongruent knee, as you can see by this drawings. So let's see 
some cases. This is a 59 years old lady. She suffered a lot of fall, no comorbidities. You can see that there is very difficult to understand the fracture pattern, but you can see that the very, very uh, huge comminution of the lateral condyle and also from the trotter area. This is the intraoperative images. So we started by uniting one, un one uh, condylar unit by putting all together the anterior component of the medial condylar with the lateral condylar uh, distal femur with the posterior area. So this is, we are solidarizing this. Then we decided to put all together with the trochlear. You can see the trochlear now is in the position. And then we close all the femur together. And then we, when we could have a very good uh, articular reconstruction and metaphysical reconstruction, we decided to use a non-locked plate on the medial side as a medial wall because of the medial comminution. And then we decided to use a locked implant. So you can see now we are putting some screws, some leg screws to hold the anterior part of the lateral condyle, condyle with the half a fragment. And this is the final fixation, the immediate post-op. And this is after one year, you can see some degree of osteoarthritis, some, some osteochondral uh, fragments in the joint, but instead, the lady has now a very nice uh, knee after one year and she can walk with no pain. This is the last case, a very huge, uh, difficult situation. The patient had uh, uh, a right comminuted distal femur shaft fracture or, or, or distal shaft fracture and uh, a complex left distal femur fracture. You can see a uh, very large metaphysical comminution, a very large articular comminution. She is a polytrauma patient. So we decided to do some damage control in the beginning. And you can see the patient with multiple X6. And after the patient was very nice, we decided to do the reconstruction. And this is the preoperative planning of the left, of the left side. We decided to use a, a, a blade plate, but we don't have it. We didn't have it by the time. So we decided to replace the blade plate by a DCS. At this time, we didn't have yet the lateral locket plate. So we decided to use the old fashioned implants. And this is the intraoperative comminution of the articular surface. Again, we decided to put all together in one side. So we hold all the pieces together on the lateral side. Then we did the, the central comminution we put all together with the trochlear side, and then we move it to the medial side. And after that, this is the final construction with some screws going from the front to the back uh, to hold the Hoffa component. And this is the immediate post-op. And this is the patient after two years, we had to put the patient again uh, at, the, at the OR to, to take out some screws from the front because of the patella the patella is, was, uh, was uh, not moving adequately. The patient uh, had some knee stiffness. So we had to take these screws out and to release the knee in the OR. And she's now about zero to 95 degrees of movement. But again, a very difficult situation with a very satisfactory function after all. So the take-home message is when we talk about these uh, difficult situations of C2 and C3 high-energy comminuted fractures of the distal femur, we have to know our enemies, our challenges, our fracture problem-related problems. So the first one is to understand if we have or not some metaphysical comminution. The second one, and this is more common nowadays, if we have previous implants, not only uh, uh, autoplasties, but also implants to hold, for example, uh, femur, proximal femur fractures. And the last one is about the articular comminution. So I think we have two problems when we, we talk about articular comminution. The first one is the trochlear involvement, as I just showed to you. And the second one is the Hoffa, the Hoffa injuries. 
Uh, when we talk about the metaphysical combination, we have to look for a biomechanical medial augmentation if you have some medial metaphysical combination. So nowadays, we can put two plates, a lateral one and a medial one, or we can do a, a, a nail plate combination. And this is a very elegant solution for this metaphysical combination. And finally, when we talk about trotter involvement, we have two principles. The first one is to try to, if possible, of course, to reconstruct the articular surface. So go to the condylar areas before. So we start with one condylar, then we go to the trochlear area, then we go to the other condylar area. So don't try to put all together without having the, condy the condyles reconstructed before. And the second principle is to avoid interfragmentary compression. So you have to understand that in this particular fractures, we can't or we should not use large screws because otherwise you're going to uh, narrow the condyle areas and we're going to have an incongruent need. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you again, guys. And Marinis and Jamal, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. A variety of cases with interesting challenges. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. So the first one is that how would you avoid narrowing of the distal condyles when there is a combination in the medial zone? Uh, this is a very difficult situation, Nagashri. Uh, what I try to use is try to put all the pieces together. And we have to remember that articular pieces, they not go to the garbage. So even though we have an open injury, I try to put everything together. We have to save all the fragments and try to, mon to, to construct the puzzle. Uh, when I don't have one of these pieces, what I try to do, I don't have, as I mentioned, bone bank. What I have to do is try to use some bone graft, some autogenous bone graft to put in place. Uh, even though these pieces of bone, they don't have a particular cartilage, they, they occupy some space in order to reconstruct all the morphology of the condyle. So when you have this condyle reconstruct, we have, we are able, you, you are able to put everything together. Many times, many times, and we have to remember that we don't have some pieces and you have to think out of the box. If you have a bone bank, you can use, for example, osochondral, uh, autograph. If you don't have it, you have to solve the problem. So what I have to do is to try to have some autogenous bone graft just to occupy the space in order to reconstruct all the condyle. Thank you, sir. For the next question, we have uh, one of the uh, participants asking uh, for the fractures extending into the T-care component, do you rec recommend distal intramedullary nailing or extramedullary fixations? Uh, this is a very nice question. I always prefer to use the nail plate combination, but if you didn't do the, the replacement, for example, I show a case, the lady had a TKR eight years before in the US. So I'm not, I was not the surgeon that uh, performed the TKR. So you have to understand a little bit better uh, which type of TKR the patient has. So I recommend to do a CT scan in order to understand if you have an open box to put a nail. Otherwise, you have to use two plates. But if you have an open box in the femur component of the TKR, I, uh, I prefer always to do the nail plate combination. I start by reconstruction the metaphyseal zone, then I use the nail and then I go to the lateral plate as an augmentation. Sure, sir. Uh, another question, is there any specific guideline uh, to use an additional plate, the medial side, when there's a combination is there? I'm not going to tell you that there are guidelines, but there are some recommendations from the literature. As soon as you have a medial wall comminution of the metaphyseal zone, you have an overload in the lateral implant. And uh, I, I mentioned uh, there is a very, this is a pre-published pre uh, article from Michael Gardner. Uh, Michael and the colleagues, they compared 
three different locked lateral plates, and they found in the situation of the medial wall comminution, the metaphyseal medial wall comminution, they, they found uh, up to 14%, 14% of non-unions because of the instability. So we know that non-unions arise from mechanical instability, and there is a lack in the bone biology, and they found also 9% of mechanical failures. So uh, although we don't have yet guidelines, we have strong recommendations to use a second implant on the medial side when we have a huge metaphyseal uh, wall combination. And I always do that. What it didn't define yet is that which type of plate, if you're thinking about use two plates, which type of plate you have to use on the medial side. Some authors recommend the proximal humerus locket plates, the phyllos plate from, for example, from BPS, uh, and we have others from other companies. Uh, some authors recommend uh, LCP plate as a, a elliptical plate. So the plate starts this on the medial side of the femur, then goes to the anterior part on the more proximal part of the femur. Uh, personally, I prefer to use a uh, proximal locket plate, a proximal humerus locket plate. I think it's easier to apply on the medial side. You don't have to do a very huge approach to put it, uh, and this is my preference. But again, there is no guideline to use uh, two plates, and, and uh, <coughs> we don't have guidelines also to use... Uh, uh, one plate over the other plate. So when would you prefer to use fibula? Is there any specific indication for that? Or? Uh, I like to use fibula. Uh, I think we don't have to do microsurgery to use a microsurgical fibula graft. You can use a free, a free graft from the fibula. I like this the most. Uh, and, and sometimes I use the fibula and I use a medial plate, so I put both. So I put a lateral plate, I reconstruct the biology of the with a fibula as the medial wall, and, and also use a medial plate. So I use both. Sure. So I put Thank some biology and also some mechanics. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank so you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. That was a, a really nice talk. And um, I think now we'll uh, move along to Peter Giannoudis. Unfortunately, Professor Giannoudis has been caught up in the operating room, but he, but he had the opportunity to record his talk. And uh, please enjoy the talk. I've been told that the, um, the voice is a little low, so please turn up your sound for uh, as high as you can in order to be able to best enjoy it. It's my great pleasure to contribute to this um, very interesting uh, webinar. A big idea in trauma care. To start with, I would like to express my appreciation to the scientific committee for the invitation to participate. I'm a Peter Genotis. I work in Leeds, England, and the topic of my talk today is distal femoral fractures with comminuted focal fractures. I would like to set the scene with some facts. First of all, to remind everyone that the Popa fracture was first described by Albert Popa at the beginning of the 19th century. Basically, it was defined then as a unicondylar intraarticular fracture in the coronal plane. However, we know nowadays that uh, we can have by bilateral in injuries, bicondylar injuries. These are rare injuries secondary to high energy trauma. And depending on the epidemiological data available, these injuries occur more frequently in the lateral than in the medial femoral tile. Since there is involvement of the intraarticular portion of the joint, that means that there is a significant risk of displacement 
of the fracture, and therefore, surgical fixation remains the gold standard treatment of these injuries. In terms of the classification, the Lettner classification has um, held its um, uh, position over time. So, for those of you that you are not familiar, there are three types of uh, fractures. The type of one, where the fracture line is parallel to the posterior femoral vortex. The type two, where the fracture line is behind a line parallel to the posterior femoral vortex and is subdivided, subdivided A, B, and C types depending on uh, the size of the fragment. And finally, we've got the type three injuries which represent an oblique fracture line of the posterior femoral vortex. Now, in my opinion, two recent publications focused on uh, mapping of fracture lines and how to determine the surgical approach should be um, uh, known by everyone that has to deal with these injuries. So let's look into the first publication. Uh, this is the paper that was published in the American volume of uh, JBJS. Basically, uh, the authors uh, uh, undertook two and three dimensional sitting mapping of total fractures. They reviewed 75 cases with CTs and they proposed fraction mapping which illustrates fraction characteristics and the combination zone of the thermal condyle. And you can see here the different fraction lines that uh, they were able to uh, register depending on this um, exercise. And they concluded that hopa fractures occur more frequently in the lateral thermal condyle. In the axial plane, fractures commonly extended from anterior lateral to posterior medial in the lateral condyle and from anterior medial to posterior lateral in the medial femoral condyle. And in the sagittal plane, fractures transverse from anterior inferior to posterior superior. And articular comminution was more commonly seen in the lateral condyle, condylar fractures, and concentrated in the weight bearing zone of the articular surface. And that further supports the view that all these injuries must be, must be managed with surgical intervention. If we go now into the second publication, this publication was uh, uh, published in the Journal of Injury. And that was uh, the work from uh, uh, the Department uh, of uh, Orthopedics in Ginny uh, Mai University Hospital in Thailand. How to determine the surgical approach in open fractures. So the authors here highlighted three important parameters that one has to take into consideration when managing these fractures. The fracture characteristics, EI, the fracture site, the degree of comminution, and uh, the fracture plane. The surgical factors, for instance, what approach one must select to be able to get good access to the zone of injury so that fixation can be implemented without any difficulty, can be executed without great difficulty. And then also, attention should, should be given to the biological factors. For instance, uh, the, uh, where is the fracture zone and the potential compromise of uh, uh, the blood supply to this area so that this should be taken into account to prevent the risk of a vascular necrosis. And you can see in this um, uh, uh, picture here, in these illustrations, uh, where is uh, the zones of uh, yellow color represent the zones with the higher risk of a vascular necrosis due to the peculiarity of the blood supply in these um, regions. 
Moreover, the authors went on based on all these previous parameters to uh, uh, describe the different approaches that one can be used. For instance, the postural lateral approach, the diet lateral approach, uh, the parapatellar approach, the, the medial sambasus approach, etc. Uh, and also uh, suggested how the screws should be inserted normally. Uh, it should be in a vertical uh, placement, the fraction line, the type of screws, and where an anti glider and buttress page should be considered in uh, all these different patterns. Finally, based on the size of the fragments, uh, and this is another kind of um, algorithm to help the surgeons decide uh, based on the size of the fragments what approach should be used and what should be the direction of the screws or whether a plate should be considered for the fixation as well. And you can see here the different uh, 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 fragments in relation to the medial quantile and the lateral quantile that one can follow based on this algorithm of management. So these two are very good papers that everyone should be familiar with and if not, please um, try to get them and read them because they will help you a lot in your um, decision making and in your clinical practice in general. Now, uh, the principles of fixation of these fractures we need to um, be able to get good access where is the fracture, that means selecting the right approach. We must be able, uh, by visualization, to reduce the articular the services first that have been affected by the injury. We, then, we, we need then to secure uh, the fixation of these articular services, and then we need to proceed proceed with reconstruction uh, by restoring the continuity of the articular block with uh, the shaft and to do that there are different implants available with direct and indirect reduction uh, uh, fixation techniques. So let me um, share with you some cases of mine. Uh, this is a highly comminuted intra-articular type C of my element uh, distal femoral fracture of uh, one of my patients, a male patient 30 years of age, who was involved in a road traffic accident. He was a more traumatized patient, he sustained, in addition to uh, the, distal, the right distal femoral fracture, lung contusion, eruption left femoral iliac artery, external fracture, a pelvic fracture, an associated bladder tear in the left distal tibial uh, fracture. So initially this patient was damaged, was managed with a damage control of the uh, uh, Spinal external fixator was applied to uh, resuscitate the soft tissues and uh, to buy some time to get the CT and uh, to uh, plan this um, difficult intraticular fracture surgery. Uh, the initial uh, procedures were uh, focused on uh, life-saving sa uh, interventions. Uh, for instance, uh, the iliac arterial lesion, the, blood, the bladder uh, tear, the pelvic fracture, and uh, the sternal injury with an associated lung contusion. You can see subsequently here the CT scan, the extent of the condition of uh, the articular surface. Of, uh, element of the uh, injury uh, using a lateral, uh, a parapatellar uh, extensive uh, approach. All the joint was um, exposed. And initially, uh, the construction of the element of the injury was um, uh, was uh, carried out. Uh, you can see here in the property picture the, the diminution and the different uh, fracture uh, lines in terms of the overall uh, articular surface and following the construction of the of elements of the injury uh, reconstruction of uh, 
the bilateral of a, a fraction lines took place, and then the whole articular block, block was, was um, connected to the metaphysical uh, area where there was comminution as well. And you can see here the uh, interoperative uh, uh, picture, the coronal uh, uh, operative uh, uh, picture, and uh, how the joint was reconstructed. Uh, in this case, you can see that at two years down the line, uh, the patient had a very uh, good outcome with uh, uh, an anti step uh, uh, articular surface. There was no um, progression of osteoarthritis and the fracture is normal. Let's go to a second case. This is again another uh, multifragmented uh, uh, distant femoral uh, fracture. A female patient, uh, 48 years of age, motorbike accident, isolated injury, close fracture. In this case, uh, due to uh, the combination of the injury, a tibial tubercle osteotomy was carried out for better exposure of the joint. A femoral distractor was used to maintain uh, the alignment of the leg, gain a reconstruction of um, the joint and the profile elements into place. Uh, you can see here uh, the profile element of the injury you know, from the intraoperative picture. This is the tubercle, the tibial tubercle osteotomy um, uh, tissue being uh, moved aside for the picture. The intraoperative uh, image to uh, 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 demonstrates the articular block, how it was reconstructed. Then uh, the block was attached to the metaphysis with a locking plate, as you can see. This is the interpreted picture with all the fragments being uh, put together. And you can see again the evolution of healing uh, 12 months down the line of this very difficult in injury. And let's move, on, let's move on to another case. This is a very interesting case. Uh, I was called to theater in this male, 35 years of age, motorcycle accident, open distal fracture. He had previously uh, a femoral shaft fracture that was stabilized with a nail, and you can see also that he had an, an associated patella fracture. I was called to theater, and you can see here in, in the interoperative pictures, and, and then uh, again an extensile uh, 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 lateral, uh, paramateral approach, the HOFA element, the, the stabilization of this injury, and you can see here the articular uh, defect that was present. Uh, in this case, I decided to take autologous grafting from uh, the anterolateral dial, as you can see here, and this centimeter area was measured. Uh, this is the osteotomy from where the graft was harvested. It was replaced with a block. And then it was placed in the area where we had this defect. It was secured with um, uh, two millimeter sc uh, screws and it uh, uh, advanced uh, rather underneath uh, the cartilage. And you can see here the uh, evolution, uh, the, the, the way that it was uh, fixed and the evolution of healing in this case. So, in summary, to conclude, distal femoral fractures with community hobby fractures, they represent challenging injuries. We must proceed with a careful evaluation of the injury utilizing the CT scan. We have to select the right surgical approach to be able to get access to the area of the injury. You must remember the zones of risk of aspirin necrosis and if you follow the principles uh, of um, uh, reconstruction, good results can be expected as it was shown in the cases I shared with you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for listening, and uh, congratulations to everyone for the great talks. Thank you. Well. Great. So that was a, a wonderful uh, talk and a wonderful display of some of the principles of fixation of these Hopper fractures. 
Uh, and there are some questions from the uh, group. And uh, one of the questions was, which diameter screws should be used to fix the hopper fractures, 3.5 millimetres or 6.5 millimetres? Uh, and the answer to this is, unfortunately, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the size of the fragment. It depends on your planning as to how many screws you would like to introduce. Um, for instance, if it's a Letourneur 1 or a 3, you may be able to use a slightly bigger screw because there is a bigger fragment, but you will have to use at least two screws in that situation because you're often compressing across a slightly more transverse horizontal fracture uh, plane that is in shear compared to the rest of the joint. And then you may also have to consider that you will have to use a plate in some instances in order to provide some anti-shear ability. So it'll depend on the size of your fragment and it'll depend on where the screws from the anti-shear plate will be as well. <laughs> and the answer is you can use 3.5, you can use 4, you can use 6.5. But if you use 6.5, you have to be careful to allow yourself enough space in order to be able to, to take care of business, particularly if you're using a, a neutralization plate. The other question that's often asked at the same time is, do we use headed or headless compression screws? And I think in the literature, it would suggest that there is really no difference between the headed and the headless compression screws, as long as they're put in pr appropriately and carefully. My, my preference is headless compression screws and I always try not to take them out, but I know many colleagues around the world that would use headed compression screws for the, um, for the Hoffer fracture. Another question is, we find that Herbert screws don't provide adequate compression and fixation. What is your opinion about using them? Well, well I think I've uh, just stated my opinion in that it depends on the technique. I think it also depends on the quality of the bone. Sometimes the bone is softer. The bone may be older. It may have osteoporosis. It may have metabolic factors. It may be significantly comminuted. So it is more difficult to provide compression with uh, the screws, either a headed screw or a headless screw. So if you are putting in a smaller headless compression screw, and if it does not work, then you may upsize it to a larger headless compression screw, if you like, as a salvage for that particular screw hole. Um, but, but look, I, I use headless compression screws and I find them to be okay. Um, with the Hoffer fracture that's missed on the assessment using x-rays, and it says here, if a CT modality is not available, that, that is a challenge. I think the, the easiest way to identify Hoffer fractures is the CT scan. And, and perhaps we are, now that we have CT scans, a little bit lazier in that we see the CT and we, we don't look at the X-ray as critically for the signs. But if you look at the X-ray critically, you'll see asymmetries on the attempted AP and lateral X-rays of the knee. And there will be differences compared to what the normal morphology will look like. Often in a fracture situation, the, uh, the X-ray is a little bit more oblique. <coughs> and you can see the uh, fracture a little bit more um, uh, easily on the X-ray if it's a little bit more oblique. But the, um, they can do a more oblique X-ray for you as well. I, I just see from Leeds, I see Peter G. Uh, w welcome Thank to the podium, just in time. <laughs> so I, 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 your talk was uh, very nice um, and everyone enjoyed it immensely. Uh, thank you for giving us your time. Uh, so I'll ask you the question since you're online. And um, so one was um, Hoffer fractures sometimes are missed from the assessment well, using x ray. Sure. What would you do if a CT was not available? Yeah, well. Um, Again, you must always have the suspicion when you've got high energy trauma to look for them. Uh, you, you will have to get some uh, oblique X-rays and if needed, you know, if it's an, an intra-articular, normally it's an intra-articular injury. So you will have to get a good exposure uh, to fix the fracture anyway. And uh, 
by flexing and feeling around, uh, 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 you should be able to pick it up even on fluoroscopy. So uh, 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 this has never happened to me for whatever reason, I don't know, we, uh, even before that we used to get CT all the time, but normally because of all this high energy trauma, you should be able to, to see it uh, with some oblique views, I would have thought. That's, that's my, uh, my answer to that. Yeah, and by I, screening I, with fluoroscopy when we, we reconstruct the joint. I, I agree. That was my answer as well, Peter. Uh, I have a, an, another question for you from the floor. And do, do you have any tips and tricks for dealing with neglected Hoffa fractures? Well, that's, that's a tricky one. So I've done quite a few of them. Uh, you need to plan well your approach. Uh, unfortunately, to, to reduce it, you, you need to do, you know, you cannot do it with uh, small incisions. You, you got to do, you know, big incisions to be able to reduce it to clinic, to, to clean it and to, to fix it. Um, all these neglected, neglected ones, unfortunately, um, a, a, a large percentage of them, even if you fix them well, they go into to a vascular necrosis with all the immob uh, mobilization and the reduction and so on, particularly when they are in, the, in, in more the posterior uh, area of the femoral condyle, which is the risky area, as it was um, eluded in my presentation. So... Uh, you need to plan it well and you need to inform the patient that there is a high risk of vascular necrosis. Do you have any uh, tips and tricks, Peter, about on the medial side, about um, how you approach the fragment from the front and the back in relationship to the medial ligament or on the lateral side, whether that varies a little bit, whether you use a single or a double small plate or screws and then supplement it uh, along those lines? Yeah, well, every every fracture is different. Every patient is different. Uh, the bone quality might be different. the The size of the fragment is different. Nothing is 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 uh, uh, standardized. That, that 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 you can say you will always apply the same kind of uh, technique, whether you do a subvastus uh, incision or. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if it's bilateral and uh, the fragments are small and so on, then uh, I have uh, no hesitation to do a tubular osteotomy to get it right. And I've done th this on uh, several occasions and I, I think I've showed, I, I've, I showed the case. Now, how you fix them, that's a different, um, that's, that's, that's um, you know, again, it depends on the size of the fragment with uh, headless screws. If it's a big posterior segment, then you, you can put an anti or a buttress plate again. So uh, uh, I can't give you a specific, it, it just depends on the case and the size of the fragment. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's right, Peter. I think John had something to, to add, John. Uh, so uh, I was just going to say that, uh, I think uh, Peter answered that question was that before we did CT scans regularly, we always used to get oblique x-rays both a left and a right oblique on all these fractures. So uh, that was one way of at least making out the fracture. You couldn't see the details of the fracture, but it would tell you that there is something more than just uh, sagittal plane fractures there. Very good. And I think Vincenzo and Apipop, they're, they're tough, tough fractures, aren't they? The non-unions of the Hoffa? Yeah. Okay. Very good. As far as non-unions go, we've done a fair number of them. And you sometimes actually need to add an osteotomy to all that Peter said, because you have an area of fibrous tissue, which you literally have to osteotomize out to get your fragment reduced into place. So that's something which you have to do quite often in some and, of and, and it never fits perfectly because exactly. of, uh, the time uh, elapsed. Exactly. And uh, some uh, also uh, demarcation and... Uh, wear and tear of the cartilage <coughs> and the subchondral bone. So you got to sure. just put it there and uh, give more Fix time it. to the patient before something else will need to take place. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for a, a great talk. And you're more than welcome to hang around till the end of the webinar. There'll be some more questions. And sure. now we'll uh, um, like to uh, hand over to Sue Yensi for uh, the next talk. 
Thank you, Dr. Marimis, for our fourth topic today. Will be delivered by Dr. John Mukopadai. It's about the open fracture and bone loss, which is it will be a lot of to deal with the high risk for infection, stability, uh, stability and the dead space. So, Dr. John uh, Mukopadai, it's time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Suinchi. Uh, I think open fractures of the distal femur uh, with bone loss is a difficult problem to deal with. And I'll start with a case. This is actually an old case from way back in 2007, where this 25-year-old gentleman was involved in an RTA and an open grade 3B fracture of the distal femur. was initially treated elsewhere. They first did a provisional debridement and a K-wire fixation, partially closed the wound and put the patient on skeletal traction. And uh, I think the wound broke down and uh, we had discharging uh, discharged from the wound and he presented to us seven days later. So that was the initial x-ray and the provisional k fixation that was done. And by the time he came to us, that was what the wound looked like. So you can see there's some granulation tissue, but absolutely white bones seen there, uh, which is the distal femur, uh, the distal part of the proximal uh, fragment. And... Uh, there's obviously some discharge in there. So uh, this was the original X-ray. There is not any obvious um, Hoffa element, but if you look very closely on the lateral side, there's a suspicion of an Hoffa element. So uh, the plan of treatment basically was first to do a thorough debridement. And then the question was how to stabilize it. Would we use an external fixator, a nail, an anatomical lock plate, or would we think of something like a mass blade technique, which unfortunately in those days was not yet so commonly used. So this was way back in 2007. So when we went in for the debridement, you can see how this entire almost 8 to 10 centimeters of the bone is just totally white with no vascularity. So we had, it, had to excise that. Then we addressed the articular surface. You can see the fracture between the condyles there. And once we had got that reduced, it also noticed the Hoffa plane fracture, which was a minimally displaced fracture on the lateral side. So we went ahead and fixed all these. Um, and uh, then for the gap, we used antibiotic uh, cement beads, not the block, but beads, because this was, again, pre uh, the popular popularity of the masculine technique. And then we got the plastic surgeons to rotate the flap of the quadriceps across so that we had some soft tissue cover for the bone. And then this was covered with split graft a couple of days later. So this is three weeks down the run. And this was now six weeks down the run. You can see how everything seems to have healed, although it's not the best soft tissue or skin that you can imagine. And now we have to decide what we do next because um, the question was whether we convert to an Elizarov fixator completely. Uh, do we go to a long nail with transport or uh, do we go for fibular, free fibular graft? Uh, ideally, in this kind of situation, if you want to do a fibular graft, it probably would have to be a vascularized fibular graft. Uh, allograft reconstruction, that's another thing which has become uh, slightly popular recently. And I think Ganga Hospital has a publication on that. And then <clears throat> what we thought about was the question of bone transport under the plate. So this was something that was not really written about much at that time and something which we had to kind of um, work out ourselves. So we put on this Elizarov fixator. We had, uh, so you can see the plate extends right very proximally. Uh, we took off uh, the screw in this segment here, which we were going to transport and we did the corticotomy there. So this was the Elizarov fixator, one on the proximal, uh, the transport segment, one in the distal segment and one in the tibia. Uh, in this particular instance, we didn't put one more proximally, although later on we started doing that as well. So this, this is, was the first case we did. And then we started the transport down the line. And so almost 10 centimeters of transport. Uh, by the time we got it to docking, we just put in two screws into the segment, locking screws, and then just took out the ring fixator. So your fixator time was just the time that it took you to transport, which was about three months. And once we took out the fixator, we just waited for all the pin tracks to heal 
satisfactorily, and then we added bone graft to the docking site. And this was him uh, in progress, and this is seven months post-op. You can see how uh, the regenerate is forming really well. Uh, the union is taking place, it's still quite stiff. Uh, uh, he had a significant lag at that time, but that, that gradually improved over time, and his flexion improved as well. And by uh, uh, at about two years, this was what he had. And then at about three years, he came with a slight discharge from the wound. So he took out the plate, and this was a three and a half year follow up. So he's got more than 90 degrees of flexion, but then his extensor lag had disappeared, although his quadriceps were not, not uh, full strength, but he was managing quite well with this situation. So in, in principle, uh, and this, this was uh, reported as a case series with a couple of cases uh, that we had done uh, earlier. So uh, in principle, if you look at this in an animated form, that's the worst, uh, sort of fracture with the bone defect. You put on the locking plate into it. Again, we use only locking screws when we are doing this kind of surgery. Then you put on your ring fixator. You take out the screws in the intermediate segment at that stage. Uh, you do your corticotomy uh, there and then transport this segment down with this ring. And once you dock, all you do is put in these two screws back in that segment. So those two screws come back there. And then you take out the ring and then you do your bone graft at the, at the, at the docking site. So that's the basic process that we kind of uh, sort of worked on when they're dealing with these bone transports under locking plates. Of course, today, the most common way of dealing with these fractures with bone def defects is the masculine technique, which was written up in the French literature by Masculet in 2000, although he was using it since 1986. And he reported on, uh, uh, on 35 gap unions with 100% union rates, although there were some problems in the cases, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. The basic principle was that the cement spacer provoked a foreign body reaction and, then, and caused the formation of a membrane, which worked as a biological chamber which prevented graft resorption and also provided vascularization and growth factors to that chamber. So it was essentially a two-step technique. The first step was excision of all the infected and non-viable bone and soft tissue. Uh, you had to stabilize the bone, which in masculine series was mostly with the external fixator. Then you filled the defect with an antibiotic impregnated bone cement and also made sure that you had good soft tissue so Alan Maskele was a plastic surgeon, so most of these uh, required flaps, etc. Uh, the cement spacer basically ma maintained the space of reconstruction. Apart from actually, I feel also gives it a little more stability. It induced a pseudo-synovial membrane and also uh, sort of uh, allowed for adequate local antibiotics. In the second step, which was usually at six to eight weeks, you remove the cement spacer, you fill the defect with cancellous bone chips, you may augment it with bone substitute, but you have to be sure before you do this that the infection is cleared. Okay, and the induced membrane, what it does is, as I mentioned earlier, is avoids the resorption of the bone graft, but it also delivers growth factors such as TGF, VEGF, BMP, etc. And here you can see how the membrane is formed. And the idea is that you put in your bone graft and try to repair the membrane over it where it's possible. The only uh, problem in this is that you require quite a large quantity of bone graft uh, uh, and you may have to mix it with uh, sort of uh, either bone substitute or allograft and some people also would advocate using BMP7 along with it. So I think the details of this technique and the trip tips and tricks were written up by Peter Giannidis et al in 2011, and then gradually it became uh, more or less the standard or became the most popular way to deal with this bone defect. So here's an example. This is a young patient with an open fracture. You can see the lot of comminution, intra-articular elements. So you have to go in, you have to fix the fracture adequately. But this area you fill with bone cement. And then six weeks later, you go in and put in bone graft. The big problem is the defect, even though 
It may look reasonable size. You need a huge amount of bone graft to actually fill that defect. So here we used a combination of fibula and bone graft. So this is very similar to what Vincenzo had mentioned. So we put a fibula on the medial side. So we sometimes augment it with a medial plate and put in a lot of cancerous graft here. So that works as a very stable situation, which then goes on to heal. And this is an early follow-up at about five months. Uh, so another way of dealing with the defect or reducing the amount of bone graft you require is this technique where we actually use the expandable cage from the spine into this defect and then added cancellous bone graft. So there's the expandable claim. So the amount of graft you need to put in is a lot less. Uh, this is it going on to heal. This patient had a stiff knee. So what we did at this stage was remove the plate and did an up, uh, Jude quadriceps plasty. You can see the incision uh, closures for that uh, medial and lateral incision. And he went on to have a reasonably good range of motion, close to 90 degrees. Of course, we left the uh, cage inside the pneumo. So again, the recent uh, sort of article in the JBJS on, on the current concepts uh, of this technique were written up with Maskele and Giannudis et al. And they talked about the optimal time now being between four to six weeks, uh, the importance of taking multiple tissue biopsies to make sure that there's no infection still there. And if you had recurrence of infection, they suggested that you go back to the first stage and again debride and put in cement again. So that's one of the problems of this is when you go back in there, you sometimes find that there's infection hasn't quite settled. So that's another situation where we could use this technique of bone transport. So here's a case, again, um, uh, we put in the plate, the uh, antibiotic cement, but when we went back at six weeks, we still found some granulation tissue and uh, a sort of infective material there. So here, instead of doing the second stage, we then converted it to a bone transport with the Elizabeth fixator, with the corticotomy, and this then, uh, and then grafted the docking site, which went on to heal satisfactorily. So I think the core messages that we get out of this is that segmental bone defects are a challenging problem, especially uh, in open distal femur fractures, and you have many methods of dealing with it and all have their advantages and disadvantages. But uh, apart from the masculine technique, which has become really the workhorse of it, uh, this combination with bone transport under the lock plates can be used in some of the very difficult situations because you can add to the stability, reduce the amount of bone graft you require, and use it even in where situations where you haven't quite got rid of the infection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. John, uh, for your clear explanation. We have some questions here. Uh, the first, how safe do you feel putting a plate in an infected case presenting late after injury? And may I add for this uh, question, how do you, for your, from your experience, how do you do the department that you sure the wound is clean so you are confident to put the inter internal fixation at the case? Thank you. Yeah, I think this is the key. Your debridement has to be really very uh, meticulous and radical. Okay, so you need to get rid of all tissue that is bad as well as that you're not sure about. It's not just obviously dead tissue that you remove. You remove any tissue that you're not sure about as well. Because uh, today you can reconstruct huge gaps, like we mentioned. So you have the method of reconstructing the gaps. But if you have infection, that is a problem. So that is the one thing. The second thing, I think in these situations, the most important, one of the most important things is stability. So once you've debrided, when you have these huge gaps, <coughs> femur and a small distal femur fragment, really the external fixator does not give you adequate stability. So I think you have to be sure of your debridement. If I'm not sure, I might go back a second time, but I try to get my plate on as early as possible so that I get good stability apart from uh, uh, because no, no form of external fixator really gives you very good stability when you have that huge gap. Thank you. And for the next question, uh, what bone graph you use to fill gap after docking? And, so, we, hmm? 
Yes. Okay. Sorry. So we, uh, in our place, we only have access to uh, allograph. We don't have access to autograph. So we use cancellous bone graft. We use fibular graft. And we might add bone substitute if the volume is not enough. And like I mentioned, we use other techniques to try and reduce the amount of bone graft we would uh, need. So like using a cage or something similar to kill the defect apart from the bone graft. We okay. do... We have access to RIA now, but uh, we haven't used it that much to really talk too much about it. But it's mostly al uh, and, uh, <coughs> autograft and fibular grafts that we've been using. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. And for the next question, uh, why did you not remove the cage when removing the plot? Well, the cage is inside the bone. So you can't remove it that, that easily. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, there was infection. The problem was stiffness, not infection at that stage. So we took out the plate. We did a proper extensive Jude quadriceps plasty, and we got back quite a good range of motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, and doctor, the question from me. Uh, in the case with the open fracture with the bone loss, sometimes it's difficult for us to get uh, the good alignment because uh, some bone is lost. We, we, don't, we, we don't know uh, how, how to realign or to, or to put in the right rotation. Do you have a tips for this kind of case? Yeah, I think so. This is where I think the locking plates help a lot because of the design. But you also need to check on the rotation because you have certain landmarks which you look at. You look at the lesser tuberosity, you look at the condyles, you look at the fibula head when you're doing your alignment. You look at the opposite leg in terms of the length. And at the end of your fixation, check your rotation. So once you've done your fixation, if you get a good range of external and internal rotation, then you can't be far wrong in terms of your rotation. Okay, but if you put the plate properly, so the if you don't put it properly and the plate sits off, which happens quite often, anteriorly, then you almost always get an external rotation of the distal fragment. So you have to be uh, meticulous about your technique when you're doing this. Okay, for the last question, yeah. yeah. I smell. How, how about do you use the BMP2 for the muscular technique for the, for the second slit? I, I have never used BMP. That's yeah. a, I just use simple grafts, okay, and it seems to work, so I don't know. So the cancellous bone and bone cancellous substitute? Cancellous bone, fibula, and may add bone substitute for volume, but it's mostly just autologous cancellous bone and fibula. And then trying to find ways to, so when we're doing transport, the amount of bone graft you need is not so much. So I don't use BMP at all, or if I have not used allograft because I don't have access to, but I, I have nothing against allograft. But BMP, I feel has some issues which we need to really consider very carefully before using. Yeah. No, because uh, it's, it's, and it's make, expensive. Uh, it's yeah. very expensive as well. And to reduce the morbidity, morbidity, so now there is improvement to use uh, IBMP2 instead of sure. Okay. I know. I mean, I, have, I just don't have uh, uh, experience with using it. I've not felt I've needed it, so we've not used it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Because of limited of time, uh, we will move to the last uh, speaker, last topic. Sure. I will hand over this to Dr. Nagasri. Uh, moving on to the last talk of the wonderful series, we have Professor Apipop, who's going to talk to us about a very complex fracture pattern, uh, distal femur fracture with concomitant femur shaft fractures. On to you, Professor. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Marinis and Gemma, and for the talk. I'm going to talk about the distal femoral fractures with concomitant shaft fractures. So in this talk, this is my outline. I'm going to start with the introduction of these injuries and move to the treatment prioritization and treatment strategy for these injuries. And lastly, I will show you all you some case examples. So this combined injury is quite 
Blair. Because from the incident, we, uh, they report that the ipsi 12 supracondyla or intracondyla disophema with phenol charge fracture is about only 3.4%. And for the ma management of the, the kind of injury is very challenging because the fee, the the preferred treatment for one of the fractures may not be the preferred treatment for the other fractures. So this is quite large injury and quite challenging for, for a treatment. So for the treatment for pilot, pilotization and strategies, of course, we should pilotize the entire articular distal femoral fractures because the complication of this distal femoral fracture are difficult to treat, like we can face with the post-traumatic arthritis, on union and fixation failure if you don't treat this distal femoral fracture well. And for the treatment, you can use the same treatment principle as the single injuries. And for the calculation of this combined injury, treatment strategy, and sequence of fixation, and now today, there is no consensus. We still have a lot of conservative topic for this kind of injuries. However, there are three factors that you have to consider when you face with these combined injuries. The first one is how the complexity of the distal femur fractures. This distal femur fracture type A is simple ones, or type B or the most complex one like type C fractures. And secondly, you have to think about and check for the location of phenom sharp fractures, like is a mid sharp or proximal or the subtalk extensions or concomitant subtalk extension that's uh, would be uh, the most difficult uh, to treat. And sometimes we face with the, some patient with really narrow canal, especially when the patient is Asian patients. And also sometimes we have a compromised uh, I am canal that we cannot use the nail for the treatment of the child fracture. So for, for the, this combined injury, I think there are different of the scenarios when you, when we combine these two injuries together, like this self female child fracture with ch concomitant child, mid child fractures, this self female fracture with subtalk, uh, concomitant subtalk fractures or proximal child fractures, or this self female with the pure child fracture with the narrow canal. So for, for the fixation options, if you have like a distal femur type A with mid sharp fractures, of course, we can treat this fracture with the single implant like a little bit nailing or long distal femur LCP. And for the type B fractures, we can treat distal femur type B with lax screw or with, or if the, that fragment medial condyle or little condyle is quite large, you can add stability with a tip press. And for the concomitant sharp fractures, you can use anti-plate little cat nail or uh, distal femur LCP if it's, it's up to you. For the type C, C1 or C2 fractures, because it's simple articular fracture, we can treat this fracture with lax group and we can uh, uh, treat the sharp fracture with little cat nail or uh, distal femur LCP. And for the type C T fractures, because these are really convoluted articular fractures, is we cannot use the nail for treated fractures. A uh, little care nailing for treated fracture because it's, the articular part is really, really severe. So we start with the articular reduction and fixation by lax screw. And then we uh, connect uh, the articular block and the concomitant chart with the list of female FCP. So this is a case that I'm going to show you. It's a, a 67 years old female got a, a motorcycle accident for two weeks. And this patient has a closed injury with the combine of the segmental fracture, which is the high A distal femur and the concomitant sharp injuries. She also had the uh, closed tibial plateau fracture in the same site. And fortunate for her, there's no other injuries. So in this case, we start with the tibial plateau first because the, the, the articular part quite simple and there's not much disfragment. So we do double plating for tibial plateau fractures. And then for the, the type A distal femur, because it's the, the oblique uh, configurations. So we do the op mini open deductions and fixation the distal femur with the chalk plate. 
and uh, with the surcharge wiring with the chart plating. And then we use the, and when you take a look at this, the position of the plate, because we plan to use little gate nailing in this case, so you put the plate at the anterior part of the soft femur that will not uh, obstruct the, the nail insertions. So in this case, we, we, for the chart fragment, we do the little gate nailing. Like this. And then it's really important that when you do repeat nailing, your, the, the, the tip of your nail should be at the laser together in order to reduce the state lysis at the subtural area. And these are final fixations. And at that time, because I, I performed this surgery more than 10, 10 years, so at that time, we, we don't have the little kid. I think we have multiple locking screws, distal locking screws, so they have only the two locking, two distal locking screws, so I have to add the plate. These are uh, fixations and six months down the line, post-operative, there's clinical, uh, the, the patient uh, has a very good uh, clinical movement of the fracture and also good function of the knee. And another case, with a 61 years old man, got a car accident, he had a, a medial condylar fractures and concomitant chaff into the, the distal area, distal sharp area. And so this is a TTB2 fractures, medial condylar fractures. So for this one, we start with the distal femur by using the medial paralytic approach in order to assess the, the joint. And then we reduce with the Polyduction cap and using the and fixing this uh, fracture with the two black screw. And because it's quite a large fragment, so we add uh, butt testing at the middle aspect of the fractures. And then for the chart, uh, we open deduction because it's simple fractures. And we, we, we reduce the fracture with the anterior plating, which is just small for just for the temporary fixation for the uh, shaft. And then we do the MIPO technique for the uh, use the using the distal femur LCP in order to fix femoral shaft fractures. And these are final fixations. And let's, let's move to another case. This is a young patient. Uh, he has a polytomasite patient. He got a lung injuries. Uh, liver injury and also he has a uh, open injury of the left distal femur, open fractures, and also he has a uh, uh, closed uh, ipsilateral tibial chaff fractures. So in this case, initially we we do the derivatement and uh, at the distal femur open fractures and uh, and span the fracture with the spanning is now fixated across the knee joint. And for for the fracture at the distal femur, when we take a look. At least these are C2 fractures because the articular seem to be simple fractures and convoluted at the uh, metaphysis area. So in this case, uh, we start with the distal femur first because we already have the external fixture at the tibia. So we do, we will do the tibia chaff later. So we start with distal femur, do, apra, uh, do the little parapella approach, going to see the fractures, reduce the fracture anatomically and fix this uh, uh, articular fractures with two leg screw. But when we took a look, take a look at this, this, this screw, it should be, because we plan to do fix the chaff with the little gate nailing, so we need to fix the screw far away from the nail track in order to prevent the, when you, uh, the, uh, the obstruction for the nail. So we use two screws to fix the, the frag articular fragment. And then we apply the little gate nailing, this is port of x-ray. And we, uh, at the end, we, we do the tibial nailing. So this is six, uh, five months uh, post-operatively. Uh, this patient uh, has a really good uh, healing at the fractures in at the distal femur, also the femur chap and also tibial, tibial nail, uh, tibial fractures. And he can uh, quite a full length of motion of the, of the knee. So what about if the we have a distal femur with the proximal sharp or subtalk fractures? So in this kind of fractures, because we cannot use the 
the data clear building to, to fix the chart because it's really short segment. And if you use, if you use the data clear building, it's going to fail. So in this case, we have to use like a combined nail and plate fixations, like uh, for the type A distal femur with the subtoque fracture, you need to use, fix the distal femur with distal femur CP and use a long uh, proximal femoral nail to fix the subtoque fractures. For the B type and C type, the same, we, we still use the combined fixation between the FLCP, leg screw or blood case plate for the distal femur. And for the subtoque, we have to use nail. So like in this case, uh, this is a 42 years, I've uh, got uh, injuries. Uh, when you see the fracture, it's a uh, two fractures at the subtoque and, uh, and at the, sub, uh, at the this sub femur is a, a tight A fractures. So it's the, like a this sub femur with the subtoque fracture in the same side. So we plan to use this one. Uh, proximal femoral nail with the subtoque and the FLCP for the distal femoral fractures. So my question to all is, is there any other options to fix deep fractures? Uh, yeah, we have some op options that is alternative options. Now in this case, we fix this, this uh, subtoque fracture with the reverse DFLCP and fix the distal femoral with the DF, uh, distal femoral CP because we, we cannot use the, the single plate for the whole, cons uh, the whole fractures, right? Because it's really quite uh, far away. So at the, the point that the, these two plates join together, we use the so-called plate on plate fix, uh, technique that we overlap the plate and put one screw, uh, from one plate to the other plate to the bone. Like this. And it's a function, uh, as, uh, post of one year. Uh, with a uh, good uh, length of motion and also the good healing of the fracture. But I tell you, this is alternative technique because I think what standard technique for to treat this subtoque fracture with soft femur, you can use proximal femoral nail combined with the uh, this soft femur LCP as a standard technique. So what about the this soft femur fracture with uh, sharp fracture with you have a problem with the you cannot put the nail because you need only the plate fixation, like you can, you can use the, uh, the, the whole fractures to fix the bone, the, the combined jury with the VFLCP and we, you may need extra long plate, like a 15 hole or seven hole for heating is the fractures. And also you can use the plate on plate that I, I showed you before. So like in this case, uh, 41 years old man have a fractures cross injury at the shaft. And when you take a look at the knee x-ray, we can see some uh, extension of the soft femur. And for the shaft fracture, this is really small canal, so it's not possible to put the nail in. And also he said a bunch of injury that we, we have to be careful about uh, using nail in this case. So in this case for the CT, when you take a look at the knee CT, we found that it's a, uh, uh, some uh, media hop valve fracture, also the interarticular uh, intercondyle extensions, but quite non displaced fracture. So in this case, we start with the with the fixation of media hop valve by using the parapatellar approach, and then uh, we reduce the shaft with the same technique that I I I, I like to use with the anterior plating uh, with some DCP. And we connect the whole point stuck with, with the long, really long, uh, DFLCP 17, 17 holes. Uh, and these are final fixations. So these are six months after injuries, other fixation is, uh, the fact is going to heal nicely without any complication. So for the, t uh, take home message, this is, the distal femur with the concomitant sharp fracture is a challenging injury. Even it's a quite, it's a light injury, but you have to think about it. And some, some, someday you will face with this injury. And for this combined injury, the distal femur fracture is the first priority to treat. And you need to do another correction of joint in order to prevent uh, complication from the fractures. 
for the fixation options. Uh, Retrograde nailing is a good choice for this south femur type A with the concomitant sharp fractures. And for the others, uh, combined injuries, uh, better to use uh, double fixation or 2DY option. Thank you for your attention. Nagashri, you are muted. Sorry, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for those very interesting examples and the plate on plate technique, which was uh, something that a lot of us do not know. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, two similar questions. Why do you use small reduction plates? Uh, what is the need to use a small plate anteriorly when you are applying long lateral plate to fix the femur? Is there any particular advantage of you using that? Uh, I think it's simple fracture. So if you don't use a nail, sometimes it's difficult to, to reduce the fracture. So this plate is just like a temporary plate reductions. And you use this plate like a, to help you to reduce the fractures. And after that, you put the lateral plate as the standard plating. And you can just remove the plate if you, you, you think this is stability is enough. But if you think it's sometime and in the osteoporotic bone, the the single plate uh, is not stable enough, so we can you can leave it inside. Okay. Sure, sir. Something like that. It's just like a, a temporary reduction techniques for a small plate. Sure, sir. We have another question. If you would recommend using a single distal rocking screw in the uh, distal femur nail. <laughs> No, no. I mean, you mean if you have the this of female friend, your type A, something like that. So I think, uh, I think, uh, the for the this of this of female fracture, you need at least two screws for the this of locking. If you use the the little cat nailing, yeah. because it's a short segment, right? So yeah. you just put one screw is not enough for the stability. I think you need to fix at least two screws at least. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. And another question with plate on plate technique is the plate not too prominent under the skin? That's the problem. Yeah, you have to, to inform the patient if you would like to use the technique. Always the problem. But in the some in but in some obese patient, uh it's it's okay. But in the thin or slim patient, you have to inform you would like to use the technique. Is that something that you do very common, sir? Plate on plate technique? Or? No, 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 no. It's that solution because it's, I don't have the longest way that can fix subtoke and this soft femur at the same time. So, and uh, and the nail is not available. So I have to only two I have only that option to using plate for the fixing of this fracture. So that's the reason why I use plate on plate techniques. But it's just I say that it's is that alternative option? It's not standard options for fixing these fractures. Sir, I have a question. Uh, when do you choose between an anti grade and a retrograde nail in the proximal femur fractures? Is there any particular distance from the lesser to canter, or uh, it's just knowing where the screws of the retrograde nail go? Like, how do you choose anti grade and retrograde nail in a subtrochanteric situation? Uh, I think for the subtroch fracture, you. Mm -hmm. It's like a contact gate. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't try to use the retrograde nailing because the stability is not strong enough. You have only less short segment to fix with the proximal locking screw from retrograde nailing, right? So, so subtalk extension or combination of subtalk, better to use anti gate nailing, <coughs> whether uh, proximal femoral nail or standard nailing. Sure, sir. Yeah. Well, okay. John, please. Yeah, no, so I agree entirely. For a subtrochanteric fracture, uh, there's no point using a distal femur nail because you will not get stability. So, and for a distal femur fracture, similarly, once it's uh, in the area where the bone is uh, sort of uh, expanding, it's no point using a proximal femur nail because then you don't have stability in the distal fragment. So. Very good. So we've had a um, we've had some uh, terrific talks today. There's, there's a couple of extra questions just for a couple of minutes to tempt you, John. 
yeah. when, if, if you go back and you, you're going to graft and um, you, it's infected, how many times do you, defra- do you debride before you decide to uh, do a lengthening procedure? So I think uh, what we've done is uh, it's not happened that often to say how many times you decide, but if it is infection and if it's a significant infection, I would go straight away to a transport. If it's a very low-grade infection, then you have to kind of debate whether you still beat the masculine ones. But if it's a, a frank infection, which is obvious, then I would change to a transport do a debridement and change to a transport. But I would do it with the plate still there as long as the plate is still holding stably, the screws are not loose, there's no lysis with the screws, etc. If it's just in that area that you're not confident about uh, having got rid of the infection, this transport helps you get rid of the infection as well. Very good. Thank you, John. And Vincenzo, you know, when you're doing the nail plate combination, how long do you go? Uh, I go up to the I go up up to the subtrochanteric region and I stop buying the, the intertrochanteric line. So yeah, it's I it's, think that's it's important. Intertrochanteric line and the subtrochanteric region. You yeah. never should stop below the subtrochanteric region for an obvious reason. You're gonna have a subtrochanteric fracture, and if you go up to the intertrochanteric line, you have a high risk of vascular injury in the anterior locking uh, bolt. Yeah, so I think they're important points for the younger people online. Long and strong, but just between intertroch and subtroch is good. Uh, Ismail, I have a question for you. With uh, You used external fixators to supplement your isolated condylar reconstructions. Do you ever use range of motion or dynamic fixators with those knees or do you always use static fixators? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this uh, PT, this, we only have the the spanning external fixator because of uh, in one of, uh, and I'm, I think two or three cases, uh, not only isolated medial condyle fracture, but there is associated with the ligamentous injury, patellar ligament injury, and also tibia plateau injury. So that's why uh, with a short, short, uh, I mean, temporary fixation, one month, and then I remove. Because I think, I believe with only one month, we can, uh, we can, we cannot violate the stiff uh, ring of motion to prevent the joint stiffness. Okay, and, and, and I'll be pop because we're running out, out of time a little bit. So when, just for the residents on the line in particular, when you have a, a transverse simple femoral fracture of the shaft and it's associated with a distal femoral fracture, why don't you nail the, the shaft and, and plate the femur? You can do it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an option, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, you can do it. Be, uh, like I showed some cases with the C2 fracture with concomitant sharp. I do right. the, the fixation of articular fracture with screw and fix, fix the sharp with the nail. You can do it. Uh, especially when, the, when you have a patient or elderly patient, I think, and you, you have to allow the patient uh, early ambulation. I think, yeah, yeah. So I think it's, if if the elderly patient, you can you can better to use nail for the shaft, and the, and this self femur sometimes you have to use the combo something like that. Yeah, I, I agree because you have to be careful with the long plate. It was what I was asking that you don't create a a high strain environment in the middle of the plate with the screw uh, combinations. That's all. Otherwise. Your, your plate will fracture in the middle. You, you're good because you dispersed your screws between the bottom and the top, but it's yeah. important that don't put too many screws around the, um, through the lateral plate uh, close to the fracture on both sides of the simple fracture. Otherwise, it will fail. It's, it. it's long period with less screw. It's, I think it's yeah, that, the message that you're going to, would like to, to point out, right? My name is. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, I'd like to uh, thank everyone. It's been a a, a good uh, morning, afternoon or evening of uh, discussion. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Ismail uh, Dazubroto from Delongo from Indonesia, uh, Vincenzo Giordano from Brazil, Peter Giannoudis from Leeds, John uh, Mukubadaya from hey. India, and Abhipop uh, Kritsani Filbum from uh, Thailand. And I'd also like, like to thank our two moderators who worked very hard today, <laughs> Sui Enchi, uh, uh, Limbong, and uh, Nagashri Vasudeva. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you to Jamal Ashraf for all his support and help. And thank you to the APOA and the Asia Pacific Trauma Society for this great educational event. Uh, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. So have a lovely day and bye for now. Great to see you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.